Hi everyone, welcome to the last week of content in immunology and biotechnology. Now, this week we are going to visit a topic called ligand evolutions. This video is going to be the part one of the series, and you're going to receive part two on the coming Thursday to complete this grand finale of my lecture. Now, I can't wait to get to the content. It is a very exciting topic to me. Well, let's go start. All right, guys. Let's start with this week's lecture. Now, this week is our final week for material presentation. So, okay. Now, next Tuesday is our next class for immunology and biotechnology. Okay, and I am not going to present any more new material uh, on next Tuesday. Now, this lecture is designed for you guys P two uh, for the biotechnology portion, and this lecture also apply for the current P four. Okay, several of the P four are doing some epi activity with me, and this uh, part one lecture it's uh it's also designed for them as well. Okay, now I have this new theme uh going on on for this uh you know finale. Okay, let's call it finale. Okay, and like many finale, okay, of those forty five minutes one hour um TV episode, there is part one and part two, right? Okay, so this one is the part one of the finale, and it kind of set. A stage for part two, ah,、uh, but again, it's also it's a self-contained story. Okay, that you are going to hear from me, ah,、uh, in the next forty-five to one hour time. Ah,、uh, I actually don't know how long it's gonna last. Okay, <laughs> but anyhow, so this ah、uh, presentation, I was called presentation because it is more like a ah,、uh, it's different. Okay, it's different than a regular lecture in my opinion. Uh, in many cases, okay. Now let's move on to some of the learning objectives. I still have some type of a learning object objective or my presentation、uh, objective, so called,、uh, for this type of a presentation. It's almost like a seminar、uh, way of doing it. Okay,、uh, it's I do it. It、with a seminar in mind rather than a lecture in mind, and then you ask me what is the difference between seminar and a lecture? Um, I see you as a scientist, okay? When I say it is a seminar, if I say I'm doing a lecture, I see you guys as a student. So I see you as equal in this presentation. So it may go above your head a little bit, but I'll try to make it uh as uh reasonable as possible and um. I I will keep that in mind. Okay, so the learning objective、uh, or presentation objective, okay, is to recognize some of the latest latest information up to mid April. Okay, up to mid mid April. So it is、uh, like again, these information that I've been presenting are fresh off the uh journals in many many cases. Okay, informations on SARS CoV two. Okay, the virus that caused COVID nineteen. In case you still um not able to um. Recognize this、uh, virus name, okay? Now and how it interacts with、uh, human cells at the molecular level, okay? We all、uh, kind of have a general idea, you know, of some type of a you know spike protein on virus and interact with the the、um, human cells and can and then fuse into it and then you know cause hijack the mechanism, cause sickness and everything. But let's look at it at a more detailed molecular level. Okay, understanding some of the concepts of directed evolutions, like the topic of today. Okay, like the topic of today, we are going to talk about the concepts of directed enzyme evolutions and phage display, like I mentioned earlier on last week. Okay, a little bit sneak. Peak of this week's content and how it applies to combating SARS CoV、uh, um, SARS CoV two virus. All right, and so that's why we need to talk about some of the concepts on directed evolution. Now, directed evolution sounds scary, but it is nothing new. Trust me, nothing new. Once I get into the slide, and it was like, oh, it is directed evolutions. I didn't even know about that. Yeah, you've been living. Potentially living with directed evolutions product, you know, 
for many many years, and I'm very very sure you have eaten something that is a result of a directed evolution. All right, so that is a sneak peek that that I'm sneaking for for you, and then let's um look at some of the. Basic scientific backgrounds that tie to the concepts of directed evolutions,、uh, that resulting in the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2018. Okay, those titles are directed evolution of enzymes and phage display of peptides and antibodies. Okay, those are still some of the relevant pro.、Uh, Topics that tie to this immunology and biotechnology course, All right? And then lastly, realizing the potential opportunity for applications in combating SARS-CoV-2. You know, what kind of, ah,、uh, um, you know, can directed evolutions be applied to combat SARS? Cove two. That's what I want to say. All right. So that's something new that I came up this week, and um, you may not find it. Available anywhere else, or at not at least not in the way that I'm presenting. So here, there's some type of a golden information, in my opinion. All right, you can tell I'm smiling and I'm getting excited for this lecture. And let's get to the meat. All right, so here are some of the current challenges. Okay, summarized from some of the latest、uh, publications. All right, and and you know, in terms of combating SARS-CoV-2. Now, currently. People have been identifying there are three different variants of uh, COV, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Or this is a pretty long name, but、um, in a, if I say it some a, a little bit wrong, you know this is just a virus. Okay, SARS-CoV-2. Okay, now there are three variants, and then、uh, basically there is this A type, B type, and C type, and this is a genetic map. Okay, they're mapping、uh, different. Viruses isolated from peoples around the world, and how it tied to what we believe the origin, which is the bat origin. Okay,、it、came from bat. Okay, well we know bat harbors a lot of、um, uh, coronavirus. Okay,、um, but we don't know, still don't know for sure if it is really mutated from that. You know, there are many, many. You know, conspiracy story online, and I won't talk about it. But、um, anyway, but this is the most possible. Uh, uh, You know, genetic tie. Currently, we we generally agree. Okay, tying into bat, and then how it linked to different variants. You know, and、uh, across the world. Now, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, there are A type and C type, or type A or type C. Okay, they are uh find outside of East Asia. Okay, i.e. in may mainly in the U.S. and in the Europe. Okay, now I know Australia have some cases, Africa have some cases, but those cases are relatively fewer. Okay, a lot fewer than uh East Asia, U, uh U.S. and Europe. So we're not focusing too much in terms of those area. In our discussion today, now and the B type is primarily found in East Asia. Okay, now what we've known or what we've observed is that A and B, okay, they are very very similar. Okay, basically separate by two small mutations, and looks like the C type is a daughter of B. Okay, you know, coming from coming from uh from the B type variants. Okay. Now it's believed that the immunological and environmental,、uh, you know, factors, you know, making it, you know, perhaps making、uh, the B type more difficult. Okay, more difficult to survive outside of Asia. Now that it's been a speculation, 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 speculations. Okay, but we don't know for sure. But this is possible, possible. All right, and now I've been trying to to look for some articles. See, hey, there are, now there are three types, three variants. There, what happened? What exactly is different other than the small genetic variants?、Uh, Does it affect phenotype? Okay, i.e., does it affect the spike glycoprotein that on the, that is residing on the surface of the、um, virus? Now, I couldn't find any report yet. I'm I'm sure there must be something undergoing because this、uh, variant was just you know. Quite recent publications, and when you need to go look at protein structures and everything else, it takes a little bit more longer time than just looking at the genetic sequences. So I'm sure in the coming weeks, probably there are more informations on these、uh, variants and what 
difference phenotypically you know are there uh, I hope there aren't too many otherwise it would be difficult to develop the vaccines or effective vaccines for these um, these uh, you know different types of variants all right uh, I pull one of the latest report okay one of the latest there are many many publications these days and you can basically get drowned in in the literature almost you know every day there's something new come up and you can spend you know hours to read it but I just pull one okay pull one of those uh, it is published in cell okay the journal cell a very reputable uh, journal that we have um, let me change the link ink color for today I figure this is a little bit more difficult to see blue um, let's do white white on white yeah that looks a little bit more visible um, in many cases okay now so this is a um, cell journal so this article you know have a title called structure functions and antigenicity of soft SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein. You really look at glycoprotein at a very, very detailed level. Now here are some of the four bullet points or the highlight points they pointed out uh, just at a glance of the article. All right, they pointed out SARS-CoV-2 uses ACE2, okay, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, our beloved one okay to enter target cells okay now these target cells are not solely limited to uh, your alveoli cells okay and you know we have seen cases uh, that this um, virus infecting uh, ACE2 uh, you know protein or enzyme okay that are expressed on in the systemically okay in other parts of the body and lead to a, a flare a systemic uh, immunological flare and those cases many cases those are the dangerous cases can very easily lead to uh, you know uh, death okay so we know that it is not only limiting to the lung now now co uh, SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 okay it's this SARS-CoV-1 okay came from the uh, the uh, epidemic or a small pandemic situation in 2002 end of 2002 to summer of 2003 now I'm sure uh, this is very distant for you guys okay uh, it happened mostly in East Asia it's like in China Hong Kong Taiwan uh, those places there they are about a couple thousand people got infected not as um, you know massively in terms of the populations got got you know affected but the death rate okay the uh, the mortality rate were a lot higher those were about 10 percent mortality rate versus um, the SARS-CoV-2 the mortality rate right now it's you know still in a single lower single digit on average you know if, if you look at the global data okay so looking at the comparisons okay of this SARS-CoV-2 versus SARS-CoV-1 okay viruses okay and they find out they have very similar binding affinities okay the tightness okay binding affinity to ACE, ACE2 enzyme and another highlight point they point out is structures of this SARS-CoV-2 spike by glycoprotein you know can exist in two confirmation form there's an open form and there's a closed form and we're going to look at those deeper and then lastly the point that they highlight was the SARS-CoV uh, polyclonal antibody that were find in uh, mice okay have the ability to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 spike mediated entry into the cell so this is uh, the diagram okay in you know that is the representative um, diagram showing you know correspond to this last message there all right so that is the highlight of the the article and I listed the uh, it is open open access okay if you're interested in learning more of the detail after my presentations on the topic you're welcome to go to uh, you know just you use that URL there to search uh, on you know this this article okay and you can get it anywhere uh, in the world. So let's take a deeper look on the s protein of um, in general the coronaviruses COVS. There are actually I think about six different types okay of coronaviruses that are known to infect human and uh, if you search those different types of coronavirus the CDC provides you a uh, CDC website provides you a very nice breakdown of uh, each one of those and the COVID-1 of course is one of those six.
Okay, so now it has a uh, you know this S glycol protein. Several of you pointed out, uh, very good. You guys pointed out in the previous assignments. You know this assignment two when we talk about the lateral flow assays and said, hey, it's possibly this is the target where it's being you know stick on the lateral flow assays and being detected now this s protein or s okay you know, simply say it as s as a homotrimer protruding from the virus surface okay the homotrimer now here is a digital rendering of the um uh the the or the ribbon structure of the the um s protein here now each color here is showing you one of the um homo uh, one of the monomer now homo trimer means they have three okay three things stick together and each one of those are the same look the same now uh in order for you to know what it visually means let's go to a scene and look at it that way all right here we are looking at the clay model of the s protein now the blue part is the s1 subunit and the reddish orange part is the s2 subunit all right so i have to thank uh, my son kai okay he helped made uh, two of the three uh, homo trimer okay now i'm assembling it together okay I'm um, sorry that I kind of move off of the, the camera but um, these uh, strange shape actually can fit together quite neatly believe it or not nature is powerful all right so here is the uh, upright orientation you can see the s1 subunit spiking up on top okay and one of those would be sb domain and the bottom of it and see how the s2 subunit interact together all right come back okay come back i hope that little clay model shows you uh the you know the you know three dimensionally what it's look like okay what is happening uh with this s protein now that you know in my model here i told you that the blue part the moon shape part is the moon shape or the banana shape part okay that i try to make make uh this this subunit okay is the s1 subunit okay and then there is the the longer you know strict part okay is the s two subunit there okay so each monomer have these two subunit interacted together and then forming that one single monomer all right so get it now there are also uh you know functions tied into these subunit now the s1 subunits contains uh the receptor binding domains okay domain so here we the bigger one we call it the whole thing we call it trimer homo trimer one of the three is the monomer and the monomer have two subunits s1 subunit and s2 subunit and within the s1 subunit there are basically two domains okay we're going to talk about the different domains and domains you can think of it it's just the chunk there okay if you see two chunks okay basically you can say there's two domains okay those domains okay one of the, those domains have a function to stabilize the anchoring functions on the ace 2 okay basically it was you know, able to stick to it okay hang on to it it's like almost like a hook you can think of it as like a hook hook onto the ace 2 and then the s2 okay s2 subunit contains uh the the fusion machinery okay it is this one that is actually doing the fusing part okay you need to uh touch it and then you know fuse it okay that is like a two-step why a two-step process all right another deeper look okay now uh here you know i kind of repeat some of the earlier informations uh from the previous slide i just kind of copy and paste and change to a different figure and okay this is a different figure from the same article and tell you uh you know you know looking at a different subunit here now i mentioned earlier on the s1 subunit have uh the sa domain and the s B domain okay Ooh, wow. so one of the two curves that I showed you early on is the one of the domain okay uh, in fact if you can say the left one I think is the um, the SA 
and the, the right hand side one is the SB now those are not the the details that you need to know for sure but what we know okay SB domain binds to ACE2 of the target cell okay so this is a key message that you know you know that is responsible key finding that is respond that that are useful for developing uh, future vaccines and uh, therapeutics okay so that is the um, that is the message and looking at the f uh, figure here now it shows you uh, these glycoproteins here in the glycans okay anilin glycan uh, so you know to be so that it's more complete uh, visual uh, now but if you uh, see here is the orientation that is standing up okay if you know in a graphical way it's like this mushroom head uh, you know my son that says there's a mushroom head and you tilt it okay 90 degree angle so like I show you in the clay model you're looking at at the top okay looking at the top okay there are three subunit there and then you you can twist it 180 degree this is the bottom okay this is the bottom okay DDO and bottom view of the how three of the things kind of nicely knit together like the knit together as, as well like I show you in the clay I think the clay model helps right okay all right so and then now we have you know identified the SB domain being the main player and let's look at the details of this you know um, SB domain okay now here I sh again I show you these molecular orientations uh, so that's why I show you that clay model so that you have a little bit more uh, concrete grabs of what's going on with this little s protein or s spike protein whatever again whatever you call it just s right so here there are two confirmation people observed okay there is this closed SB domain versus open SB domain now they you know they look at viruses and you ask me how they look at it so they do a very high resolution electro uh, electron microscopy actually looking at the virus yeah actually you know virus is still large enough that you are able to observe directly on under the electron microscope okay and looking at they saw some different orientations on the spike okay at any at given time when they look at this uh, field of uh, viruses okay they find 50% have at least one open SB domain okay and then another 50% of the populations have three closed SB domains now open here it's tricky okay closed this figure is a closed one okay like the caption said this is closed and the open basically it is just you know kind of moved up a uh, move away a little bit okay so it's you know believe that this open confirmation may be important for anchoring to the whole cell okay maybe you need to move out you know basically casting like a hook you can think of it like casting a hook a little bit to hook on to the ACE2 protein or enzyme right now those are molecular you know interaction dynamics let's look at it more mathematically mathematically we're talking about kinetics kinetics right you guys should be a little bit familiar with kinetics and here we have a term called equilibrium disassociation constant or k sub d okay k sub d is calculated on based on k on and k off now i won't go into detail and you're not responsible for you know memorizing these uh you know you know or re relearning these kinetic stuff but here uh just to show you the data what they um achieve now looking at the graph here there is two graph okay the top graph is uh, the interactions of the um, SARS CoV 2. This is CoV 2. And the second figure here is for the CoV 1, or simply say CoV. Now, these are binding curves. Now, you don't need to uh, really know how to interpret it. This curve is a little bit deeper in a sense that basically they titrate the different concentrations of the uh, protein versus the uh, domain, and then they look at interactions. And uh, basically, the higher the, 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 the bump, the, the the more the response okay more the response and the higher the affinity and based on these value there are computer program to estimate these uh, KD values there K on or K off now uh, um, 
I do in in my lab in Hong lab. Okay, uh, we have uh machines that are capable of generating curves that are in this similar fashion. So we can measure protein protein interactions in just like just like this in the paper. So, uh, it is a uh quite expensive technology that I acquired uh, a couple of years ago. Anyway, so the KD, let's go back to the KD value here. What it means is that the smaller the value, okay, smaller the value, um, the higher the affinity. Now here we look at the two value here. The KD for SARS-CoV-2 is 1.2. Uh, plus or minus with an error uh, of nanomolar and SARS-CoV-1 have a 5, a roughly 5 nanomolar uh, affinity when it is interacting with human, human ACE2, okay, human, H represents a human, so which one is higher affinity, COV-1 or COV-2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, COV-2 is the winner, Right? The lower the number, okay, the smaller the value, the higher the affinity. What it means is that it interacts better, tighter uh, to uh, this ACE2, human ACE2, than the original one that come from 2002 to 2003. All right, so that is the um the idea. Now you're asking me like these nanomolar, what it means. So usually in nanomolar interactions, these are very very strong, uh, very very strong interactions. Okay, um, that means like you only need one point two nanomolar of this protein. Okay, you will reach fifty percent of the you will saturate 50% of the interactions, okay? So that is the KD. KD is the midpoint, okay? Uh, so, I, I, okay, I'll give you a little bit more information here. Usually, you know, when they uh, plot these graphs, you they have a saturation curve, and the KD usually is the, the midpoint of those concentrations, more like here, okay? So that is beyond what you are responsible for. Uh, so, you know, again, don't worry too much in, in terms of your thinking about exams. Uh, next Tuesday, I'll have more uh, details on those. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Trust me. Don't worry. All right. All right. So here is the, you know, kind of of a proposed molecular event uh, of mem membrane fu uh, fusions after, you know, in this in this paper. So basically, you know, they're proposing the SB domain is in, and that need to be in an open confirmation, casting the hook, or oh, okay, what I said is casting the hook, and then there is a confirmational change, okay, you know, you, you co open something, or you cast something, your hand is moving, right? There's a confirmational change lead to a protease cleavage on the SB S2 subunit, okay, by this protease called furin, okay, so furin, so you need to be, you need to activate this S2 subunit, we haven't talked about this S2 subunit this that much, because now again, this paper, we're focusing on the uh, SB domain of the S1 subunit, okay, get those clear, SB domain of S1 subunit, okay, so there's a little, a lot of terminology, so we haven't talked, we didn't talk about a lot of the S2, um, it wasn't the purpose of this paper actually so uh, but they know that s2 subunit is need to be activated for membrane function uh, fusion actually this step is almost universal it's universal for all coronaviruses so uh, and then after this universal step happens the viral will gain entry to whole cell and do its job replications getting getting you know crazy getting having party so and we get sick all right, so here is the summaries, okay, summaries and, uh, you know, of this paper and now moving on opportunities too. All right, so here is the, the facts, okay, that is listed, that are summarized from this article saying SB domain of S1 subunit, all right, so here is the key thing, okay, key domain, key part of the, the protein that, that, you know, that is the target for uh, designing therapeutics or uh, vaccines or you know okay so here is the question that we want to ask when we are thinking about opportunities can we disrupt its open or close confirmations right so if we can disrupt its open and close basically you are you don't you don't let it to cast a hook maybe you know if it can cast a hook it can fish right it can fish out it cannot fish our cell so that is one question we need to ask ourselves second question can we disrupt the interactions uh, with the ace2 
if so, how? Okay. Now we know for fact for the fact that you know if we isolate uh, some mouse, uh, you know, uh, antibodies. Okay, we can disrupt the interactions to an extent. So can we uh, enhance? Okay, these type of uh, uh, disruptions with monoclonal antibodies. Okay, more humanized antibody. Right, things that that we've been talking about the whole semester. Okay, leading to this lecture, actually, and then um, can we have some type of a decoy receptors, maybe or decoy enzyme? All right, uh, remember something we talked about in uh, various places. Things like Embry, okay, Embry and Teracept, okay, what is that? It's an actual receptor fused with a part of the uh, antibody. So can we have something like that, like a decoy receptor, so that the virus will bind to the decoy and will not bind to our cell, right? So that is one potential way for treatment, right? Now, and then in terms of looking at the S2 subunit, can we block its activations? Okay, you know, for example, maybe at the Kievich site when it, you know, you know, prevent it being activated or block um the some of the furin uh, protease activity. So those are potential way of compacting this viruses. Now, in fact, there are other papers. And it's actually there's at least one more paper showing you there is a new molecule they synthesized that shows some uh, promising activity in preventing the S2 um, uh, activations or the the fusing mechanisms here. Okay, uh, again, those are investigational uh, stage and mostly it's in a petri dish, basically cell cultures. Okay, so now the bottom line here is that it's we need a novel ligand with high enough affinity and specificity for the above targets, right? You know, we need something that bind very tight and also bind to the COV2. You know, the specificity here we, we're referring it to as the COV2. Now COV1 and COV2, they are essentially quite similar in many ways. So we need something that can bind to COV2 and not to COV1. So, okay, that is that would be probably the ideal case. So what are the potential treatment options here? We have things like we, we know, you know, very, we're familiar with, okay, small molecule drugs, okay, small molecule drugs. We could have you know, biologics, okay, MAPs, okay, monoclonal antibody, or decoy proteins, like I mentioned early on. So those are the potential things that, well, basically, they are everything, okay, that everything that we have to uh, to use as a um, therapeutic treatment um, agent. And so, how do we have find out these molecules? How do we do that? Now, MAPs we talked about uh, in in our uh, various lecture again, various lecture uh, in in gem module as well as in immunology we talked about using hybrid domer technology. Okay, we can generate MAP. All right. So, but there are ways, other ways of doing it. Okay, there are other ways of doing it. Right. Well, we're going to talk about it. So, in here is the another way of you know different ways to generate the ligand. Okay, the binder. Okay, ligand. You can think of it as the binder. You can do rational design. Right. What I mean, rational design is that now we have these ribbon structure. You know, very precise mapping of these spike protein. Let's use computer. Let's use computer to design a small molecule that can fit and block the certain position so that it won't be able to bind to our ACE2 enzyme. All right. These things has been done in the past. Okay. Rational design. So it's nothing new. Now it's not my. My area. I don't do computer mapping at all, so uh, it's not my area. I can tell you the general process, but I don't know how to do it at all. Or we can use systematic screening, systematic screening, and this is what we are going to talk about. And this is the tight the topic that tied to these uh, Nobel laureate research, and that's something that I actually do in many cases. Let's. All right, so let's move on to this exciting topic of uh, today. Okay, this part one is the concepts of ligand evolutions and selections. Now here we have the first, uh, you know, researcher here, Dr. Frances Arnold. Okay, so he she uh, is the co-recipient of Nobel Prize for Chemistry in two thousand eighteen, and her work what accredited you know, accredited work was directed evolutions of enzyme. Okay, now uh, I actually saw um, Dr. Arnold's one of her presentations in one of the um, ACS um, 
American Chemistry Society national meeting back in, back in 2015 in Denver. Actually, um, I had the fortunate, uh, you know, opportunity to uh to saw her to to listen to her presenting her topic. That is before three years before she received the the prize. So now nowadays, you want to listen to her, it would be like. Super, super. Even you can't even get a sit seat these the, these days. Okay, so I, I um I didn't meet her personally, but I but I was you know in the seat of listening to her. So and so what? Let's give you some introductions on on directed evolutions. Okay, what what is behind evolutions? Now these are concepts that that you you know right. Natural evolutions of enzymes actually existed. You know, since the emergency emergence of life on Earth, okay, that is a quote that I got. You know, it's been there a long time. Natural selections or natural evolutions. We are who we are because we, you know, some of our protein changed. All right, uh, you know, our an ancestors may have a lot of hairs, and we lose some hair. So those are all changes in the enzymes and proteins, right? And over a very very long time. Right, and a lot of the evol evolve evolutions is to evolve and improve the fitness of an organism to tackle different conditions, the challenging conditions. Right, so those are the natural selections, right? Rule of natural selection that th those are Darwin's rule. Okay, those are nothing new at all. And what we have been practicing in the, for hundreds of years are these actions called selective breeding. Selective breeding of stock and companion animals. Look at this picture here. Look at this picture here. That's what I'm saying. That you may be living with, you know, directed evolutions, you know, for a while. If you have a certain type or certain breed of dog, right? Look at how we directed, nearly, you know, selectively breed these uh dogs so that you know have certain traits that we like or personality that we like. So this is an example of directed evolutions happening right. In our house, okay, we got the product, of course. And what's next? Direct selective breeding of plants. What is this here? Watermelon. Watermelon. In sixteen forty-five, in some of the Middle Age painting, this is what this this what watermelon look like. Very little red meat. So much seed. You know, not very edible. And through selective breeding, we generate the watermelon we have today, full of flesh. Everybody had it before, right? I I assuming everybody had watermelon in their lifetime. So that's why I said at the beginning. Okay, if you remember from the beginning, I said, um, yeah, you we've all enjoyed the product of selective or directed evolution. All right. So what happened in those cases is that we saw a differences. We see a differences in the end product. Obviously, the watermelon from sixteen forty five is different than from now. And some of the dog picture that I pointed out, they look very different. Now, what is the leading cause for changes in phenotype? Phenotype tied to genotype. Okay, something genetically changed. And lead to some type of a different protein or enzyme, and leading to different expressions, and that's the end. That is the idea of directed evolutions, right? Right. So it is not rocket science. We are living with the product every day. Now, you know, in a sense, directed evolutions of enzymes are steps that performed in laboratory. Okay, with some type of a molecular insights to speed up the process. Okay, we know what we want to evolve. Okay, and let's speed it up. Okay, uh, you know, through systematical process. Now, it really relies on intended variations of protein sequence that is. Defined at the level of randomness. What it means is that we create some randomness at the protein, and then let's you know now we create a small populations of different protein or enzyme, and let's go through the some type of a、uh, special screening and selection strategy to screen out those changed or variants that have the desired property that we want the the, the property that we want. And it is a iterative process. So it is a cycle. Basically, it is a cycle, circular process. It goes around and around. Right. It start with a you know protein starting state. Okay. You know 
for example, we could have an ACE, natural ACE2 protein. We have some type of, generate some type of a mutation, okay, genetic diversity, and then clone it into certain expressions and screening systems, and then that, you know, screen it, screen it, screen the enzyme out, okay, and then repeat the process. And slowly and slowly, with this direct evolution, you are screening the molecule that have the satisfactory performance level, you know, something a higher, you know, binding, okay, higher binding affinity, specificity, or higher activity. It may be able, a very few enzyme of this, the amount of this enzyme can catalyze a product or, or reactions, right? So, that is the idea, basic idea. Now, this is the graphical uh, workflow of what's going on. No, so um, here, you know, in case you um, didn't catch what I was saying in the word form, here is another way to look at the presentation. So you have some DNA, okay, you know, introduce some mutations or diversity to it. And then you ended up have enzymes that are slightly different, okay, from here and there on. And then, you know, you perform some type of a screening. Now, these screenings are specific for the, the specific enzymes. So there's no general rule to do it. This is one way of doing using some type of a plate and signal, okay. If they catalyze a product and perhaps it will generate a signal, those that generate a signal will be uh retained okay those that doesn't generate a signal i didn't perform a certain uh enzymatic reactions will be discarded yeah go to trash literally go to trash so um that is the idea and then you repeat okay you repeat and re again you introduce some other mutations and eventually this pool will get very very narrowed down to the the enzymes that are having the the best or highest activity or desired activity and Therefore, there you go. You have what you want. You get your product. All right. So, what are the current applications of this direct ev evolution of enzymes? Okay. So, they are all they like I said. It increase efficiency. Okay. These direct evolve and increase efficiencies, and that can help. Okay, help to catalyze some of the chemical and biotechnology, uh, biotechnical type of a uh, reactions. Okay. So. Basically, you can have enzymes that which are degradable can help with the uh, certain ca certain process. Uh, before that, you may need to use metal or organic catalysts which are detrimental to the environment. So it's more green. Okay, there is a term called green chemistry. So it's more green, like definitely a good thing. Now, if you do direct evolutions of human antibody, that can lead to useful therapeutics. Okay, that actually tied into our next. Uh, segments of this applications All right in practice in a nutshell now I don't want to go into detail uh, of it but I'm here I'm just going to present you how things are done okay in theory okay I don't want I don't won't go into the basic you know the technical detail here it's just the rundown now first you need to have some type of a diversity also called we, we call these things library okay library uh, you can think of it as the library, right? Contains many books, okay? Really, you know, ideally each one of the book is different, right? So there's many, many diversity in a library. Here we're referring a library of molecule. Each of those have a little bit different, okay? Usually, you know, in these cases, um, for practical reasons, we don't mutate a lot of the amino acid sequence on an enzyme. It's about 200 to 300. So that is enough, uh, you know, really enough to uh, to do the work honestly for enzyme screening and we can also introduce some randomness with error prone PCL so okay so we sometimes PR, PCL that we learn about it's not perfect okay there are mistake okay instead of st sticking a T to an A you stick a G to an A so that is an error there so and it will get inherent in many cases and there are, and then you go through different selections and screening technology. Now, like I said, those must be adopted for each enzyme. Okay, it, it need to be uh, specific for individual enzyme depending on their functions. So maybe coupled with a cellular survival functions here. Now here, if a desired enzymatic activity can detox, of, you know, can rescue a cell, then then you probably want to use, you know, some type of a cellular-based screening, 
right? Some type of a cellular based screening so that, you know, those cells that live on, meaning they carry the high activity enzyme, they can detox so that we will carry it on for another cycle of screening. Right, so that is one of the idea. Another idea you can you can, like I said you can couple it with some type of optical measurements for SM proteins and all these that we talked about previously that can you know that can generate a signal when there is a enhanced activity. Right, so and it can also be cell free, nothing okay, just basically a in vitro um, selections and basically you put it in an emulsion droplet contain ribosome and library uh, mRNA, then you can also do the screening. All right, so not to focus on the great detail. Now, here is an idea. So enzyme selections are actually a little bit different than you just looking for a binder in many cases because we need the activity, right? Enzyme, if you just want to select something that bind and with no activity, Activity, you don't do direct evolutions of enzyme, you do, you do direct evolutions of other protein ligands. So this is the one of the key differences in uh, in this this technology. Now here shows you a graph A and B. Now here basically what it means in these two graphs, A is showing you, hey, this is a natural reaction. So if a enzyme, okay, if an enzyme th that can, you know, cannot do any of the new reactions okay this is green area is the new reaction if there's nothing overlapped there's no point there's no point to to mutate an enzyme that cannot do anything i.e you don't want to mutate a protease you know to cover for functions of a ace2 enzyme right they're completely different enzyme you don't you don't do it that way you mutate something that have a little bit crossover like this if there is some type of a cross reaction on uh, the original protein it is worth trying it's it's worth trying to direct it its evolution direct its it, it evolve uh, you know some type of mutations uh, to generate high F activity to what you know uh, for the new reactions all right so these type of uh, uh, enzyme selections only very small number of cycles are typically needed so the time is not as long to do these uh, evolution as to compare to other type of uh, systematic screening that we will talk about now here comes to the exciting part of today one of the exciting part of the today so this is this is dr hans thinking dr hans thinking Okay, I'm sure other scientists are thinking as well, but uh, you don't hear from other scientists, unfortunately. So the only scientist in this topic you may be hearing from is me. Uh, you may like it or you may hate it. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, I try to present uh, what I'm thinking right now uh, or in the you know before I make this slide okay so here we have you know try to tie to this um, direct evolution topic to SARS-CoV-2 and what can we do to combat this virus now here we'll just list some of the fact okay human membrane bond ACE2 is the target that we need to look at in this case and we know the binding between SB domain and ACE2 uh, have a very high affinity I represent it with 1.2 nanomolar KD okay now so the whole project that I think uh, I'm thinking <laughs> is the, the central idea is to evolve or select for a decoy ACE2 with higher affinity basically toward the SB domain of the S1 subunit on SARS-CoV-2 so that when the virus see this decoy protein it will be bind okay it would bind to this decoy and not binding to the cell right isn't that a great idea so that you rescue you know giving ACE2 alone is not enough in my opinion because yeah you can have recombinant ACE2 you give it but how does the, the you know why would the virus prefer binding what you give versus what is on the cell right so there's no inherent tendency for it to to choose either one of the two we need to give them something better something they like much more right so we need to give them a bigger fish okay than the cell so that they will catch the bigger fish right and then not catch the cell catching the fish is a good analogy i think in this case all right so what to do what to do here are some of the objectives here i listed here just for fun okay you know some of the task in this 
grand research project is to randomize for randomize some of the amino acid residuals on the ACE2 that are responsible for interacting with the SB domain. And then we can use some type of in vitro selection based uh, with optical reporters. Or we can use cell-based selections to, to screen for enhanced cellular toxicity. Now, this is not survival that we talked about, enhanced toxicity. Imagine, imagine a cell is expressing, okay, a cell is expressing a um, ACE2 protein, okay, ACE2 protein that have higher, that have higher, I lost my voice, that have my higher affinity with the SB domain. So SB domain will bind to it more frequently, right? It bind to it more frequently or more easier. So what does it mean is if you're a, a virus carrier bind to this cell with a higher affinity, that means this cell would go to, you will be dead easier, enhance cellular toxicity. So that is one way to do this type of uh, enzyme ev evolutions, in my opinion. Now, once you find out the enzyme, you need to do characterizations, find out the KD specificity, and is it really better than the original one? If it is not better, there's no point to carry on, okay? Now, if it is better, then you can carry on, design some type of fusion decoy protein. Now, we are moving to the next phase, basically designing some type of a therapeutic. And then you can, in the lab, okay, in the lab, in the academic lab, you can probably wrap up with animal-based testing using the decoy protein, looking at efficacy and PK and PD data. All right, PK, PD data, those are difficult things. And at, the, at that point, if you're all successful and having a good story, industry will buy it, sell it to industry. Yes, in the academic lab, you, you know, some of the, you either partner with them, get a royalty or something, and then, and then that's it. You know, there's only so much you can do in an academic lab. Um, now here, yes, I'm referring to academic lab. Right, sounds great idea. Anyone want to help me together write up a proposal? I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure, you know, there are people doing this already. People that are naturally doing this enzyme evolution must be doing it, uh, must have been doing it, generating preliminary data already. So it is too late. Yeah, it is already too late. Research, it's, it's always time. All right, now move on to the second one. Now this one, it's a little bit more uh, understandable, a little bit less background because we learn about the concepts of ligand evolutions. The concepts are the same, okay? We are screening for something that is better. All right, now this one, you have a more random library here. Uh, basically, we can use the, uh, the two gentlemen, okay, Dr. Smith and Sir Winter, okay, got this prize for uh, phage displays of peptides and antibody, phage display. All right, I have a little bit of a story on phage display, actually, um, and we'll we talk about it in uh, the next few slides. So basic concepts, directed evolutions of proteins, then protein here, uh, we are talking about peptides or antibodies or also antibody fragments, okay? Those SCFV or FAB, you know, part of the antibody that we talked about uh, over and over again, those can all be uh, directed for evolutions. All right, so these things are coupled, okay? Basically these, you know, basically we're tying to the, the um, the phenotypical uh, properties, okay, the affinity uh, of the binding uh, a protein with the genotype, the G DNA sequence. So it is the DNA sequence that are generating, you know, novel uh, fragments every time and then being displayed on uh, the phage, you know, so that we can do these uh, directed evolutions. Now it came out. Uh, the the concepts came out in around 1985 or 1988. But the first two paper, okay, actually uh, appeared uh, right about the same time in the Science Journal in 1990. 1990 seems seems to be a breakthrough of everything. Now you will find out that in the part two of this finale. Basically, 1990 is a a, a year that to be to be remembered, I feel like, at least for my field of research. Okay, now, um, really these um, DNA sequence code for a specific protein, you know, and then, and then it's packaged into a, a phage, and these phage present that protein on the surface, and 
at the end of the day, you infect these phage uh, to E. coli, okay, bacteria phage, and for doing the multiplication process, and the cycles carries on and on, and have rounds of selections, rounds of selections. Uh, students that have been doing uh, research with me uh, are very familiar <laughs> with this term, rounds of selections. And then uh, following a similar iterative procedure. Now let's look at a, a in a graphical way here. Now this uh, nice picture on the left here, uh, that's the story. Okay, I spent many hours drawing it in two thousand fifteen. All right, in two thousand fifteen, I drew this picture in two thousand fifteen November. Okay, why did I draw this picture for whatever reasons? Okay, now the reason is I used this picture in my uh, research seminar presentation for interviewing the current job. Yeah, my position as assistant professor of pharmaceutical science at Wills University School of Pharmacy. Right, so I when I was interviewing, I had to present a research seminar uh, to all faculty member that want to come to listen. And one of my research proposal was actually doing some type of a phage uh, display library selections uh, for some type of a therapeutic use. Uh, I still want to do it. I haven't got to do it, but I still want to do it. So this is, uh, in theory, my field also. Okay, so that's why I have a little bit uh, story uh, that, that I mentioned early on. Now, okay, coming back to the detail of the figure here. Now here we have a bacteria phage, okay. Uh, this DNA that will code for a small amino acid. That could be small, it could be big. And the idea is to have it interact with a target that could either be immobilized, okay, or fixed on a surface or being on the cell surface. Okay, here on the uh, right hand side here showing you, hey, this, this is a cell. Okay, this is a cell and have a, a protein specific t uh, molecule that are on top of the cell and you have a phage carrying a, a protein interacting. All right. So the process here is the phage library. Each individual uh, phage theoretically carry a different uh, an amino acid indicated by these little uh, shapes and colors. Okay, and you interact, have it, you know, let it interact with whatever you want to interact, so called a target. Now, and then basically you go through a lot of washing steps. Okay, yeah, washing. Yeah, you you put other buffers into it, shake it, wash it, those that bind tight will be retained and eluded out, and then, you know, infect the bacteria and use the bacteria mechanisms to replicate the binders. And, and then you repeat the cycles, you repeat the cycles, on and on and on, and finally you will find your binder. It's not a difficult concept, right? It's not rocket science, I always say. Now here uh, are some of the uh, other concepts uh, on protein library and diversity. And uh, really, the, it, it could be any size, you know. Uh, it could be small as small as 8 to 20 amino acid in length. In fact, there are commercial uh, available phage library, okay, phage library that have, uh, you know, between 7 to 12 amino acid, uh, you know, it's about a thousand dollars for the the um the library to you know to purchase it's not that crazy expensive in terms of research and it can be used for a long time so uh that that was what i had in mind when i was giving um the presentation i'll just go buy a phage library all right so you, you can you know save some of the designing process and usually this protein like i said is hooked on and being displayed on the organisms or in this case phage now here you know when we are talking about these selections we always want to think about the um, diversity of your library here is an example for 25 amino acid theoretically we could have 20 to the 25th where's that 20 coming from 20 amino acids right Okay, so that is the theoretic maximum. Uh, for the uh, 7 uh, AA library, the maximum is 1.28 times 10 to the 9th. So that's very, very large, very, very large. Now, uh, honestly, uh, this is in theory, in practical reason, uh, due to some construction technique and, you know, limiting uh, technology and bias insertions during your um, DNA uh, randomization that uh, we cannot synthesize uh, a long 
amino acid, okay, particularly we cannot synthesize entire uh, antibody, but we can synthesize and we can do randomizations on the DNA level. And we know that there are, um, you know, only so much, you know, a lot of different code will code for the same amino acid. And that's why you have these bias insertions. And the, in theory, the di diversity uh, of these phage di uh, displays, it's around 10 to the um, 7 to 7 or so. Okay, still a lot of diversity, in my opinion. All right, so what has been done with phage display library? Okay, so here we have the our our beloved drug, adalimumab. Adalimumab, the first fully human therapeutic antibody derived from phage display. Now we didn't talk about this little level of detail in the jam module and as well as in earlier uh, lectures in immunology, but here I present you this adalimumab was from phage display all right now we we all know this function so here is just fyi here i don't want to talk about it again i feel like i've been talking about it for a long time now what other protein display technology can there be now we can have cell base or cell you cell free base cell base we we learn about phage yeast yeast ring a bell okay i'll I'll show you another picture later on. We can use bacteria to display, or we can use mammalian cells, and we can use other cell-free ribosomal display, mRNA display. Now you don't need to, you know, know the details about these things. Here, just are I'm showing you the technology that are available to do these protein display system. And here is a graphical representations. All right, so here is the phage display. Phage, you can have cell-free. Basically, you are just uh, using the ribosome and mRNA. You know, put it in a my cell, and you can do some of these job. Okay, and you can also uh, use uh, the the e cells for display. E cell, does it does it look familiar? A recap: e displayed of SCFV library from last week. A lecture of antibody drug conjugate. All right, so yes, that's why I uh, keep saying this is uh, my area of research in in many sense is that I have worked with East displayed library uh, for SCFV, like I mentioned, uh, um, you know, in in previous lecture in previous episode. <laughs> anyway, um, so here just a, a recap. So um, and, and these are very functional uh, library and. Um, it can generate uh, great binders, you know, that's in a nutshell note. All right, more nutshell. There's a lot of nutshell to crack to, uh, in practice. Uh, the the selection, actually, they are not, not crazy, okay, not crazy method. It's similar to very classical affinity purifications, i.e., you just need to fix uh, on a target on a solid support, okay. There are many ways to fix things. I won't go into the technical detail. Basically, you just you, know, you think of you can think of it as having a Velcro, um, snatch it. Okay, you 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 fix the, the the target, and then you put the phage into a pan. Yeah, into a pan. So here you have a dish. You have your target, on being fixed, and you put your phage, on there in a pan, and then shake it back and forth, panning. Okay, and then you wash it, like I mentioned earlier on in the in the graphical way. You wash it, and then those that that will be ha will have a tight affinity will left over, and then you carry on your cycles. So this is panning. Another way of doing it is to do cell sorting. All right, cell sorting. So when you are doing a cell, um, that that is the idea that we talked about earlier on. So when you have a cell that have a protein displayed on its surface. The phage, you can probably label it with a fluorescent label, okay? When it's interact, the, the interacting or binding, sticking, your cell will light up, okay? You will light up in a, in a cell sorting machine, uh, fluorescent activated cell sorting. Then you, you can isolate those binders and then you put it back into the bacteria and have it replicate. So this is not rocket science in my opinion. I think it's very manageable uh, at any given stage in your pharmacy career to understand this concept. And that's why I'm presenting it. So Dr. Hahn is not doing rocket science uh, research here at Worlds, but, um, but, but something fun. I think this is pretty interesting. Anyway. All right, so coming to the, you know, almost last slide, it's a little bit over an hour now, uh, you know, hang in there and we'll wrap up with another exciting Dr. Hans thinking. All right, Dr. Hans thinking. Or proposal. 
<laughs> All right, proposal. All right, so again, here we have the same idea here. Uh, we have the ACE2, okay, we have the ACE2 as a target. I'll be, be brief. Basically, its central idea is to select for peptide antibody or antibody fragment with high affinity uh, toward uh, the SB domain. All right, so really, you need to start to have a some type of a library you can create one or you can buy one right and then you do in vitro selection with panning technology we just went over or you can use fast based uh, fluorescent activated cell sorting base to select for uh, using East library or you know also you can you may also use the um, the phage library okay because there's a cell there it's easy to um, to sort and then uh, you can have the um, uh, affinity and specificity characterization like always and mop optimizing you know its interactions with a cell if you are doing it with just a protein if you are doing it with actual cell it's a little bit you can maybe you know easier in, in, in some way and then animal based testing likewise efficacy and 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 um, PD and PK and PD. So what you are finding really it's a molecular binder either an antibody fragment or full length antibody that can bind to this uh, SB domain so that it won't bind to our ACE and then you there you are there you have your therapeutic agents and then you sell it to industry again uh, like likewise in academic uh, it's very difficult to carry on uh, a, a investigational drug from um, from start to finish purely in the lab okay so what are the conclusions and perspective? Now, you know, that's my conclusion and my perspective. Okay, that is mine. You can have yours. Um, you can dis disagree with me. Um, but here is just mine. Um, so compacting SARS-CoV-2 have many options, right, in my opinion, and waiting to be investigating. And in fact, I think these activities are going on, okay? Or as soon as this lockdown is lifted, you know, people go back to the lab, you know, things are, people are banging, banging these, these research. And there are many ways to screen for functional proteins, i.e. enzyme or antibody, and they don't need animals, okay? You don't need to use the hybridoma technology with those, which are ancient, in my opinion, all right? These these new technology we are talking about less than thirty years old. And hybridoma is like 50, 60 years old technology. All right? If you remember the the timeline that I show you in last um, lecture, and through these uh, technology, actually, I didn't mention it too much. You can actually, you know, immediately generate human or humanized protein. Well, if you put a human gene in there, you generate human protein, right? So you don't need to do the, like a fusions or you know you don't need to worry about um, immunogenicity okay lower chance for ADA what does ADA stand for anti-drug antibody remember okay anti-drug antibody one of the hurdle right and then the basic screening it's easy in my opinion in many way uh, when I say easy it is really easy trust me and it can perform in academic labs with the right equipment and funding so supposedly if Dr. Hong have the money, have the money to buy the protein, have the money to buy a phage library. I can start this experiment in a couple of weeks. I can start screening for a peptide that bind to SB domain in a couple of weeks, just right here at Wilkes University. So you don't need a lot of fancy things to do these experiments. You can, you can start in a very, it's easy to start. Okay, that's what I want to say. Now, the final tick here that I circle now, you know something many other pharmacy students don't know, I think. Um, so you can tell your uh, your friends that perhaps go to other school uh, that, hey, I learned about how to, you know, fight SARS-CoV-2 from Dr. Han, okay? Um, and let me tell you, you know, you could do this, 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 and that, and actually, these are not rocket science. And um, and if you know someone that are um, that, that are still designing pharmacy school, okay, uh, and ask, tell them, you know, you learn exciting new things, like brand new things here at Wilkes School of Pharmacy, and please come to our school so that is the final recruiting message now to now this is the wrap up for part one and i hope you enjoy this lecture or presentation as much as i do like i said don't worry about the detail to memorize you know to for exams okay don't think about exam when you're listening to this presentations 
All right, trust me, trust me in this time. And here now, this is the end of part one of this、uh, lecture finale or season finale, whatever you want to say. And stay tuned for the part two. I'll see you next time.